Um, so uh, we're going to talk about allergies and immune deficiencies. And, uh, you know, I wasn't sure I wasn't sure how much interest there would be um, since in immune deficiency, it's the infections that take, you know, the lion's share of the interest. And, and I'm, I'm never really sure how interested people would be in, in allergy uh, until I was on the lunch line today. Um, and I, I needed a kosher lunch. And so I'm in the special uh, lunch line um, for my kosher lunch. Um, and, and I saw the length of that special special lunch line for people with allergies of all sorts. And so I knew that there would be a decent crowd in here today because I waited a very, very long time for my, <laughs> my kosher turkey that I got. So, um, okay, so let's, what I wanted to do is to give a, a real overview of allergies in general. And then, and, and get everybody on the same playing field. Some people, this will be totally repetitive. For some of you, this will be something new. Um, hopefully, somewhere in there, someone will learn something. Um, then I wanted to go through specific issues about allergy in immune deficient states. And then the last thing is to just give some information about specific immune deficiencies and the stuff we do or we don't know with respect to allergy. And actually, then I hope that we'll have time for questions as well. Um, because it's, it's uh, really most helpful if people are really hearing me um, that, uh, that they interact. I think um, that way you can really hear is when you interact. So um, what are allergies? So what, I can, what we can be pretty sure is an allergy is if someone anaphylaxis. That's when you lose your blood pressure, um, your, your throat can close, you can pass out. And that's the most severe thing that can happen for the most part when you have an allergy. Um, when you break out into hives within about four hours of a food or a drug and real hives, um, that is for the most part an allergy. Good old fashioned hay fever, um, when you get the sniffles, especially when it's seasonal, um, that and your, your eyes get red, that's an allergy. Lots of asthma attacks are. Some asthma attacks have nothing to do with allergy. The oral allergy syndrome, so that's something that people really get twisted around. Um, that's where you have lots of hay fever, and then when you turn 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, or maybe even older, uh, your mouth starts to itch when you have fresh fruit. I guarantee there's people in here who've had this happen. Um, and uh, the good news there is if you just cook it, it'll go away, and if you swallow it and digest it, you will not have anaphylaxis. Um, I guess if you kept your mouth on it the entire time, you could do something bad, but otherwise, um, that's the oral allergy syndrome, and it's important to distinguish that from a true food allergy where you need to carry an EpiPen. Um, and then, yeah, you can have GI symptoms as well, vomiting very soon after eating something, uh, assuming it's not really bad cooking. Um, it actually can be um, an allergy in that case. Now, I'm calling the second type of allergy mixed allergies, and that's where it's not an immediate I do A and I get reaction B. Okay, it's something that's more drawn out. It's caused by similar things that cause typical allergies, but it's not your typical allergic reaction. It's more of an allergic state. You see what I'm saying? Uh, and that's often eczema is what we think about. So it's really actually the minority in, in, our, in our hands. The minority of eczema patients can tell you what makes them break out. Uh, it's, it, besides being dry or something like that. They can't tell you a food or something that they get exposed to that makes them break out. They just have eczema and it sort of waxes and wanes. But that's still very much being caused by the same things that can cause allergy. And very often if you have eczema, you'll have another kind of immediate um, allergic reaction. Um, there's something called eosinophilic esophagitis, an incredibly underappreciated medical phenomenon uh, where, and I'll just describe it, and if you haven't even heard of it, I'm sure you've heard, you either are, a number of you are experiencing it or know someone who does, and that is where you think you have reflux, you get some pain in your esophagus, but most often you swallow something and it takes about five cups of water to get it down, or maybe even it just gets stuck there, and in the most severe cases you have to go to the ER for them to get the thing out of your esophagus that's stuck there. And that's happening because of allergic inflammation of the esophagus. Now there, cutting foods out after about two or three weeks will sometimes um, make it better. Um, but it is hard because it's not like an immediate reaction. It's something that takes a long period of time to build up and then it takes a long period of time for it to go away. And it is absolutely seen in many, many different um, scenarios. And then there's protein proctitis or proctocolitis. The most common one that, that is known, that the people are familiar with, is the infant baby 
it's of course always the firstborn who gets blood in their diaper when they're breastfeeding. And of course, that sets everyone completely crazy because nobody wants to see blood in the diaper. And they go running to the doctor and the doctor says, you're drinking milk and it's passing through your breast milk and that's giving you bleeding in the diaper. Just stop the milk and don't worry about it. Um, there's no need to skin test and you can drink milk after you turn a year of age. And there are lots and lots of people who just feed straight through it even though it causes blood in the poop because it's really not um, um, a major health issue for the baby at all. But it's the first thing that people uh, uh, imagine and if you have an allergy is food protein. It's usually milk. It can be soy as well, leading to bleeding in a newborn baby. Um, but there again, it's not at all associated with subsequently ending up having a, 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 a true allergy to, to anything else. And then things which are reactions but really are not allergies, lactose intolerance. Okay, It's uncomfortable. It's a reaction. There's no doubt about it, but it's not an allergy. Um, you're never going to use an EpiPen for that. Celiac disease. Oh, my goodness. Um, so it's in the news um, all over the place. I'm not even going to go there um, with respect to um, celiac. Um, but no matter what you want to call it, if it's celiac and the thing you think is celiac, it's not an allergy, go to a different doctor. Please, please, please. Um, it's, a, it's just something um, altogether different. There are wheat allergies, and the wheat causes an immediate you know, skin and, and blood pressure reaction, that's completely distinct from the kind of reactions that you have with um, the GI and joint reactions that you can have with celiac disease. Um, wheat, interestingly, can cause something delayed, and that is um, that there are certain people who are allergic to wheat, and they don't realize it until they go and run a 100-meter dash several hours after eating the wheat, and only upon exercising do they drop from anaphylaxis. So if you've heard of that, that's often, often a wheat allergy. Um, most drug rashes, most rashes that erupt after taking a drug are not true allergic reactions. They are adverse reactions, but they're not necessarily an allergy to that drug. Uh, reflux and heartburn, foods definitely can cause that, but it's usually not an allergic response that's causing the reflux and the heartburn. Uh, joint pain, very much you can have. Lots of different things can cause joint pain. Almost never is that because of a true allergy. Um, and then I should point out that it is repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly 50% of people who walk in and say they've got a food allergy do not have a food allergy. 50%. That's lots of people. Um, and so it's important to go find the other reason that it might be happening because you could do a whole lot more about things that aren't food allergies than the things that are food allergies. Okay. What are the other kinds of allergic symptoms? You're going to have hives. So you can have hives coming out of nowhere. This is something that drives people crazy the first time that they get it. What did I eat? What was I exposed to that I broke out into hives? Well, most of the time when you have hives for a long period of time, the term is called idiopathic chronic urticaria. And for those who know, idiopathic means I haven't a clue uh, why it's happening. Um, and when the doctor says it's idiopathic, you go, oh, it's idiopathic. They just have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so, but, that's, but that's hives. And, and again, very rarely, if someone's had hives for three, four, five weeks, it's the exception, not the rule, that someone's going to tell you what you're reacting to. If you can't come and tell the doctor, I think it's every time that I do blah that I get these hives, it's unlikely that even if the doctor tests you for 300 things, which I'm sure they're happy to do, um, then, then you're unlikely to identify what it is when you've broken out into hives, as opposed to when, like I said, you've eaten something and, and minutes later you, you break out. Um, skin, uh, chronic itching. So chronic itching can happen in lots of different um, scenarios. Included in, in that is allergy, even when you don't necessarily see a rash that's there. Um, skin flushing. So um, it's not just menopause. So there are lots of folks who suddenly um, get, wouldn't it be nice if that was just an allergy? Um, if, if there are lots of folks who can just start to flush in their face, um, usually most often in the face, but also in the rest of their body, um, it can come out of nowhere. Um, and very often that can be caused by mast cells, which we'll, we'll get into in a little bit. Um, there are reasons where chronic abdominal pain could be from an allergic cause of some sort or another, um, and it's important to try and, and pick that apart. Um, and then, of course, like I said, drops in blood pressure. There are cases where you drop, you have a drop in your blood pressure, and it's because an allergic reaction um, is happening. But that's, that's the reaction. But I just want to make sure that we cover the gamut of, of ways that you could manifest an allergy and ways in which it's probably not an allergy. It could be something you're exposed to, but it's not a classic allergy, and that sort of moves it into a different category of how to take care of it. Okay, 
Now, the question I always get, so I'm just going to put up a lot of slides. It's the questions I get so that I don't have to answer them at the end of the talk. So why are allergies happening so much more nowadays? So the, the most popular answer that you will get is the hygiene hypothesis, which is we're not getting infected enough anymore. We're not around enough to boil it down, cow poop anymore. And that's why we're having as many allergies, because if you don't busy your immune system on cow poop, you start to focus on peanuts and hay fever. Um, and that's, that's, that's the classic explanation that lots of people have been given, um, and that's westernization. That's what, what happens. Now, what is one of the great ways we have increased the number of food allergies in the past 20 or 30 years? We got so scared of allergies, we stopped giving our kids the foods, and now there's almost direct proof, it was just in the news, uh, I think it was in February in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, that introducing peanuts early uh, reduced the risk for peanut allergy in at-risk kids almost tenfold. Waiting to give peanuts to a kid who has eczema was associated with about a 15% rate of having um, peanut allergy, and giving them immediately at four to six months of age um, reduced that down to about one to two percent. Um, so that tells you immediately that if we had been giving those foods early on, we could prevent, and in the case, it's probably the same for milk and a number of other foods. The old, uh, it was really, it was to use a term that we use, a bubba mice, it was an, it was an old wives' tale um, that waiting until a kid turns three is the way to avoid a food allergy. In fact, that was a great, until they turned three, it was a great way to avoid the food allergy, and the day they turned three, it was a great way to increase their risk for having food allergy by waiting that long. Um, and then really, it's Western lifestyle. So when East and West Germany recombined, the East Germans' rate of allergies went up through the roof. Um, up through the roof. It's the same people, right? They were just divided by a wall. It was just a few generations that it had been. Um, and as soon as they got back together, the same DNA, everything, they westernized, and boom, just like that, it had been much lower than the West Germans was before, and it shot up as soon as they westernized um, their culture. And so what is that? Again, the cow poop, there's less of it. Um, the wrong foods, different kinds of foods, foods that may have different kinds of bugs in them or, or all sorts of other stuff, um, or, or even not just bugs, but uh, the types of fiber that we eat may actually modify our allergy risk. Um, and then also chemicals, right? Showers, uh, 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 sh uh, shower products, I should say. Showering's probably not a risk factor, but, but, uh, but um, and please, everybody shower. Um, <laughs> The, uh, but, but certain soaps may actually contribute to the risk itself, not just by killing the bug, but the, but the chemical itself could cause it as well. Um, and th these are mostly just theories. Not, there's not a whole lot of hard evidence for how to fix this. Um, but, but there is a major, a major discussion about, you know, how do we harness the best bacteria in cow poop to give to people when they're born um, so that we can reduce the risk of allergies. It's a real thing. I just, you know, go take a trip out and don't use all that Purell when you go out to the zoo. But don't quote me on that. It'll get me in trouble. OK, so how do allergies work? Um, again, it's not only about getting dirty. You see an allergist looks at a picture like this, and they say, oh, no, that's much better. Um, and um, and it, we, there literally are, are websites that say that uh, on there, be dirty, be healthy. It's not just about the dirt. Um, so let's, let's look at IgE. IgE is an antibody. We have uh, lots of, uh, of companies selling antibodies. I can guarantee you they're not selling IgE. Um, that would probably not go over very well. Um, and there are different kinds of antibodies. IgG, of course, is the one that um, is being replaced most of the time. Um, when, IG, when you're getting IVIG, that's IgG is what's being replaced. And uh, the point is, though, is that IgE, the guy in green there on the far right, IgE uh, will bind to IgE receptors on the surface of a mast cell. The mast cell is sitting in your skin, it's in your gut, it's in the lining of your eye, it's in a lot of different places, but it's sitting there. It doesn't move to there after you have a reaction. It's been sitting there the entire time. And if you happen to be, a, an IgE actually binds on the surface of that mast cell and is sitting, there, is sitting there bound. It's not floating around binding up allergens. It sits there on the mast cell so that when you ingest or you get exposed to something you're allergic to, it goes and, and it's diffuse, it's throughout your, it's throughout your body or it's in, in, in your gut lining, and it finds um, IgE that's specific for it. Okay, in this case it's a peanut, not drawn to size, um, but you have a piece of a peanut that binds the IgE on the surface of the mast cell, and if you have that IgE on the mast cell, that will set it off. 
So if you don't have that IgE, you can eat the peanut all you want. If you don't eat the peanut, nothing's going to happen necessarily to the mast cell. But if you have the IgE, you eat the peanut, that basically turns on the mast cell. And what it does is immediately, in seconds, releases lots of stuff from inside. It doesn't have to make it. It's all sitting there preformed, and it just opens up and releases the stuff. The most commonly known thing that it releases is histamine. That's the big thing that mast cells make. So that's why we take an antihistamine. But it should be noted there's lots of other stuff that mast cells make in addition to histamine so that if you just take an antihistamine, you may not be blocking everything. Histamine absolutely can cause drops in blood pressure. It can cause itching. It can cause hives. But it doesn't cause everything that can happen in an allergic response. Um, so that if you look at, for instance, this is the skin and the blood vessels, what happens is the skin becomes inflamed. And as you see at the bottom there, the blood vessels become bigger. Well, the blood vessels become bigger, but you have not taken in any more fluid at that particular time, which means that effectively your volume is going to drop and fast. That's how the blood pressure drops, is that these vessels are all dilating, but there's nothing to fill them, and so the pressure drops. Okay? Um, and so um, there's not enough volume to, to fill it in. That's obviously in the most severe case, but even in minor cases, it's actually becoming leaky. That's what causes that swelling to some extent, is the leakiness of the blood vessels. Um, and so again, you can get hives, you get itchy skin, sneezing, runny nose, vomiting, and anaphylaxis. Um, and that. Um, and so now, um, what's the best way to really know that you're having an allergic reaction? So again, the most classic way is hives, itching, throat closure, loss of blood pressure within four hours of being exposed to something, usually a food or a drug, and actually IV drugs have a better chance of giving you an allergy than, than, than oral drugs. That's a, a classic allergic reaction. If you haven't eaten anything or taken a medicine for 12 hours and suddenly you're just walking along and boof, this, this happens, it might be something different. It could well be the mast cell reacting, but not necessarily to something you've been exposed to. It could be that your mast cells just do that. It's very, very rare, but there is something called idiopathic anaphylaxis. Again, idiopathic, we haven't a clue, um, but that leads to mast cells degranulating without really being challenged by, by anything. Um, and uh, the other way that you can sort of know is when there's a pattern. I get a runny nose or I wheeze at the same time of year, every year, not when, just when I visit my in-laws, unless they're near like an oak tree that I'm allergic to. Um, but, um, or right, if I go to the same house, there's a dog in that house, I don't have a dog in my house, every time I go to that house, I have a reaction within about a half an hour. That's really the, the best way to know allergies. The common questions I always get is, is this an allergy, right? And, and if you can't really point to something particularly obvious, even if you don't know what's in the house, but you know every time you go to that house, it's going to be trickier and trickier to figure out what the issue is. Okay? It's just the way. We don't have magic. We don't have magic, unfortunately. That's just a good picture of highs there on the right. Um, okay. Now, what's the way for me to raise doubt as to whether it's an allergy? Um, and this, I'm just using this example because it is so incredibly common, I just want to hit it over the head with how clear I need to be about this. So I get a skin or a blood test done because I reacted to something. I don't know what it was. That person drew that, and they tested me for 300 other things just in case, just to check. Um, and they say, oh, you're allergic to milk. That's what you reacted to. And I read my report while having a piece of pizza and eating some yogurt. Okay? This is not at all uncommon. Okay? A doctor telling you you're allergic when you know you're not, but you believe them because they're a doctor and they did this test. And it's unfortunate. Okay? Uh, it has to pass the reality test. If you've been eating it and it's been fine, you're going to be okay. Especially the test is testing for an immediate reaction. It's not testing for something that takes a long time to, to, to kick in. And so uh, that's, a, unfortunately, you know, we, we go on these fishing expeditions, and the bottom line is if you go fishing enough, you're going to find something. Um, but, but the problem is, is that maybe you will end up denying yourself something that you don't need to be denied. And, and, and especially in kids, and especially for their nutrition, this, this is a major issue. It's a major, major issue that we overdiagnose. Uh, in this particular regard. The story has to be a really good story, and you only test for the things that could possibly fit into that story. If the person broke out and they had um, a Snickers bar, you're not going to test them for fish. You should not test them for fish. Unless there's a fish Snickers bar that I'm unaware of, you don't test them for fish. Uh, you had a question? So uh, there, the false negative rate is much, much lower than the false positive rate for both skin testing and for food allergies. 
much lower. It is not zero, but it's much lower. Okay, the labs that might get sent. So eosinophils, and this is total eosinophils, not percent, especially in this crowd where your lymphocyte count might be really low, your, grand, your neutrophil count might be very low, and all that's left surviving is eosinophils, it doesn't mean you have too many eosinophils, it just means they didn't get hit, okay? But if you have a high eosinophil count, usually over 750 or 1,000, it's a clue that something is brewing. It doesn't have to be an allergy, but it could be an allergy. Having a high IgE, it can be that you're an allergic person. RAST testing, this is the blood test that looks for specific allergens, and I'll show you an example, that specific allergen, specific IgE. Um, of course, uh, allergen, allergen skin prick testing. Um, patch testing, this is for sometimes when you get a rash and you think it might be like to nickel on your belt buckle um, or to like a bracelet that you're wearing, so they take a patch that's impregnated with um, the particular thing you might have an, a reaction to, they put that patch onto you and it's really usually only after a couple of days that you're gonna get that reaction. It's not an immediate IgE-mediated histamine-mediated reaction, that patch testing is something we often do. It's not necessarily as helpful for gut things that you eat. There's a delayed gut reaction. It's not as helpful for that as it is for delayed, like, you know, bracelet reactions or you know, um, earring reactions. Um, challenges. This is the gold standard. Unfortunately, it's incredibly labor-intensive, and lots of people think it's a dangerous thing to do. So you say, Doc, I haven't eaten peanuts in 10 years like everybody told me to do. I had that one test 10 years ago that said I was allergic. Uh, can I please have, get a food challenge? And the doc says, if you pay me out of pocket, I'll be happy to, but otherwise, I don't have the time. Um, and, and really, the way that things are being reimbursed right now, they don't. And, and it's, that, that's a real unfortunate thing because you might be able to pass it. Um, but the challenge is the gold standard way to know if you're allergic to something or not. Measuring something called tryptase. So if you've had an allergic reaction, a bad one, um, what you thought was anaphylaxis, and you wanted to have a really good sense of was it really an anaphylactic reaction to something, you can measure something called a serum tryptase in the first four to five hours after your reaction, it stays high. You can't measure histamine. That's gone within seconds. Um, but, but tryptase stays high for a while. And so very often, if you're in the ER, and this, especially like if this has happened a couple times and you're not sure, it's a great idea to get that tryptase checked because that can really tell you if you've had an allergic reaction or not. It happens to be, this is a dirty little secret, that full-blown anaphylaxis to foods tends not to lead to an elevation in tryptase, and nobody understands why. Tryptase is another thing that's inside of mast cells that gets released. It just lasts longer in the blood, and that's why um, we can measure that. Um, if you want to look for histamine, it's usually in urine, and it usually requires a 24-hour collection, um, which is difficult. Um, so this is an example of, of skin prick testing. If you haven't seen it, I guess if they did it on your back, it would be very hard for you to see it. Um, but um, there's just a, an example of someone who's definitely very allergic. Um, and just to point out, this is what we call the wheel, W-H-E-A-L, the wheel, the, the puffy thing. And then the red is the flare. And over and above a certain level, we would say is something that's positive. Um, and this is an example of a readout of someone who really shouldn't have had all these things tested, but they wanted to do it anyway. Um, oranges? Pumpkin? It can happen, but we ought to talk if you really are allergic to oranges or pumpkin. It's not very common. The oral allergy syndrome might make you have that burning feeling on your, on your lips. You will not come out positive for orange, though. Um, it's going to come out positive for the thing you're cross-reacting with that's in the, that's in the air. Um, but, uh, but up here where it's red, where the highest levels are, these are where, and, and essentially for, for, for these guys, oh, not flaxseed, oh, how un, 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 unfortunate for that person, um, but for peanut and milk and eggs and, and nuts um, and fish, there are actual cutoffs where we say, you know what, if you're above that cutoff, you have only a 10% chance or a 5% chance of passing a challenge. And if you're below that, maybe it's worth it. So we actually can use those numbers to guide us to whether it's worth trying a challenge. And when you're down here and you're a two and you're barely above uh, you know, what, what normal is and you say, all right, should I stop green beans, orange, and pumpkins? Really, probably not, okay? Unless there's a really good compelling story for why, for why that is. Um, I used to have a, a, uh, an attending when I was in, in a, a pediatric resident who would say, if you're going, you know, sending off certain labs is like picking your nose in public. If you find something, you better know what to do with it. Um, and so 
that is absolutely the case when it comes to some of these IgE tests where we really don't know how to interpret them. So why are we really sending them to begin with? Okay. I'm going to get in so much trouble with allergists right now. Um, okay. Now, treating allergies. Treating allergies. So blocking histamine, that's the thing you know about the most. That's your Claritin, your Allegra, um, from the good old days, Doxepin, and I forget the, the Seldane, you know, the old um, antihistamines. Um, these are things, again, Benadryl and Atarax, they're more quick acting. They're actually better um, at blocking histamine than Allegra or, or Claritin. Allegra and Claritin don't make you sleepy. Um, Atarax and Benadryl do. Taking Atarax and Benadryl lots and lots and lots of times, your body starts to laugh at it. I'm sure somebody in here knows what that, what that, it just stops working. You take lots and lots and lots of it. You are in a complete haze. Okay, uh, complete haze, um, and so it, 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 it doesn't really work well. And Benadryl, by the way, you know, you can, you can have itching from eczema, but if you keep Benadryl, the itching in eczema isn't from histamine. So the Benadryl just knocks you out, which is fine, but it's not really stopping the, not really stopping the itching. There are other things you could knock yourself out with that are much more interesting than Benadryl, but um, <laughs> this is being recorded. <laughs> okay, um, all right. Um, blocking IgE. Now we've gone from the really cheap and easy to the incredibly expensive, but I just put it up there because it is, it's going to make some sense now that we talked about how an allergic reaction happens. There's a, uh, there are a number, well, right now there's only one approved medicine called omalizumab or Zolaire, which is approved for severe asthma, it's allergic asthma, and it's approved for chronic urticaria. So chronic idiopathic urticaria. We don't know what's causing it, but we have a good way of stopping it. Um, and that's by giving this an injection. It's extremely expensive. Um, you can stop the inflammation. So that's what steroids are. Steroids are blocking the inflammation. They're not really, they're not like a smart bomb. They're more like a carpet bomb. They're going to they're gonna get rid of all the inflammation, um, but they're very, very good at, at relieving lots of allergic symptoms. You don't take a steroid and then eat a peanut if you're allergic, but uh, otherwise there are lots of allergic symptoms that are, that are blocked either by topical steroids or by ingesting uh, steroids, depending on what you're trying to do. Another thing that which we really wish we could do better is blocking histamine release blocking mast cells from releasing their stuff. There is a drug, it's called um, gastrochrom or chromalin sodium, and it used to be inhaled, it was called Intol, um, which was a preventative, uh, well, in theory, a preventative for asthma. It doesn't do much. It really doesn't do much, except for certain patient groups, um, which they're very rare. We follow some of them at the NIH. Gastrochrom seems to work for them. Um, but there are very few folks for whom these things, which are supposed to keep mast cells from releasing, they, it doesn't work so well. But if we could find one, it would, be, it would be great because that would stop histamine and everything else from being released from a mast cell. Um, so histamine, again, that's the histamine receptor, like for instance, on a blood vessel, that's blocking uh, the uh, histamine from binding. You block the IgE, and actually what happens is you actually bind up the IgE. Your IgE level ends up going up because now it has the half-life of the IgG that's binding the IgE, whereas IgE itself has a half-life that's much shorter. Uh, it's gone much more quickly. Um, so your IgE is going up, but it can't bind to anything. It can't cause a reaction. The issue with that drug, though, also is that if you have a high IgE, like over about 1,500, you can't dose it. Uh, it only works by weight and IgE level. So above that, it's really hard to, to um, give it in appropriate doses. Stopping the inflammation cools things off, um, blocking the histamine release, as I just showed you there. Um, okay. Treating allergies. Number one, preventing is far, far better than treating. We can treat anaphylaxis. It's called an EpiPen. Nobody wants that. You want to prevent anaphylaxis, right? Or you want to prevent um, um, allergic reactions, even more mild ones. So being on an inhaled or a nasal steroid, you go on it at the beginning of the season when you get sick, two weeks before you usually would, and you stay on it two weeks after you usually would resolve your, your, your symptoms. You don't sit and wait to get sniffly and then start taking it, unless you don't know that it's coming. Um, but it takes a while and you build up sort of a resistance if you go on these t inhaled or nasal steroids for your asthma, let's say, or for your allergic rhinitis, your hay fever. Avoidance is really great if you know exactly what you're allergic to and you can stay away from it, right? This is the worst question we always get. Our daughter has some mild asthma and we have cute, cute, cute little Marmaduke over here. 
do we have to get rid of Marmaduke, right? This is a terrible uh, situation to be in. If the child is suffering, suffering massively, and you can prove it's the dog, like for instance, when you go and live with grandma and grandpa for two weeks and they don't have a dog and the kid is all better, and you can't explain that for any other reason, which I'm sure there are lots of, um, then, then you can be sure. But otherwise, avoidance, especially for the airborne stuff, is real difficult. It's very tricky to avoid things like that. Avoiding foods, it's easier. Um, and then systemic immune suppressants. So that's going on in oral steroids, but that's also things like cyclosporin, methotrexate, Cellcept, all those types of things. Those absolutely can have a role in really difficult to treat allergies. Um, but um, and and in fact, people are always worried. Oh, I shouldn't you know, take this immune suppressant, I've already got a compromised immune system. And the truth is, is that in most of these cases, it really doesn't raise the risk too much. There are combinations which are bad combinations, um, but we very often, because we need to, will suppress people who already have an immune, an immune deficiency because we don't think it's, we're not crossing the streams. They're going to, they're separate areas where, where it won't be too bad to, um, to suppress. And that sometimes is necessary to keep the inflammation at bay. A couple of other things. Antihistamines, as I said, they're good for some things, not all things. They're not great for itching due to eczema, um, except for knocking you out. Um, EpiPens, we take them seriously. You should have two, and they should be up to date all the time. Um, Gastrochrom, like I said, does wonders for a few, and more than a few wonder what it's doing. That's just the point there. Um, ah, shots. And now, actually, in this past, was it? A year ago, um, you can put sublingual immuno immunotherapy for a couple of grasses and for dust, I think it is right now. Just tells you how many common allergies I take care of, not so many. Um, well, so going on shots um, or getting the sublingual under your tongue um, therapy for certain specific allergens, really the indication for those is I have failed my nasal steroid, I have failed my inhaled steroid, or any other standard of care. It's not a first-line treatment, and if you're doing well in the nasal steroid, but you say, you know, it's annoying, I hate sticking things up my nose, you know, it, the shots can help, they absolutely can, but they are not a small endeavor, and they are absolutely not without risk um, either. Um, uh, and again, they only work for airborne stuff. Okay, I've made a joke about birds and bees, but uh, they only work for air, air, airborne stuff. Shots are really not helpful for foods. Sublingual, not for foods. There is oral desensitization. Uh, that's why I put in there, uh, which has been all over the news, where you, you, you take uh, experimentally now, only experimentally, you take a little bit of peanut on day one, and you work up, work up, work up over the course of a month, and you take that peanut every day. You can make someone able to tolerate peanut. But it turns out that A, it's not lasting very, very long, and B, they can actually end up having other allergic issues that aren't immediate allergic issues in their gut, like eosinophilic esophagitis or something like that. Um, so these things can be done, but they're just not quite ready for prime, for prime time. We don't do shots for eczema. Uh, in fact, shots often make eczema worse. Okay. Um, trial and error, my goodness. This is the most frustrating thing, but I always tell people from the, from the get-go that very often this is going to be a trial and error thing. There's no magic. You know, we have things where we think it could work, but we just have to try them. And if they don't work, we move on to the next thing. We do it quickly, right? Like, so sometimes people get put on an antihistamine, and a year later they come back and like, I went on that antihistamine and nothing happened. I said, a year ago? Yes. And you stayed on it? Yes. It doesn't do anything for you? No. But that's great that you listened to me a lot, but it was my mistake for not saying just do it for two weeks. If it doesn't work, let's move on to the next thing, OK? Um, now, moving to the much more complex, bone marrow transplant absolutely will cure people of their allergies very often when their allergic disease has to do with the immune deficiency that they may have, um, but not always. So there are some immune deficiencies where they've been transplanted, and either they still have the same allergy that they had before, which explain that, it's kind of tricky, Why? your immune system should be someone else's, um, and sometimes you can get a food allergy from the, your donor, Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and in fact, sometimes the actual the conditioning regimen itself can increase the risk for food allergies. We totally don't understand why that is. Um, now, I love saying this, but I have to say it. Anxiety makes allergies worse. Anxiety makes treating allergies worse. You know this. You know that when you get stressed, you can get hives, right? That's an allergy. And if you can get stressed and you can get hives, you can imagine that lots of other anxious states will make your allergy, whatever it is, worse. Anxious kids break out into eczema more. It's that simple, okay? And nobody ever should be told it's all in your head. That's completely wrong. 
but ignoring the head is a mistake. Everybody hear that particular point? Okay, because sometimes it comes out wrong, even out of my mouth when I've really had it uh, during the But anyway, um, and um, the other thing I should point out is that, yes, it's a lot of trial and error. There are some really amazing looking, amazing looking drugs that are coming down the pike. These are not simple things. These are going to be for really severe cases, but several articles in the New England Journal of Medicine blocking a molecule called IL-4 um, and IL-13 um, has proven to be a, an incredibly effective in both eczema and in asthma um, with not much of a side effect profile compared to the, a lot of the other stuff that we, we give. Um, again, those are for severe cases, but the point is, is that we're not just stagnant. We're not only using 50-year-old drugs Sometimes those 50-year-old drugs or 100-year-old drugs are the best thing to be taking. Um, but, but indeed, there are things coming down the pike. And so that we're, you're not consigned to a fate if you've got an allergy. Okay, I just wanted to show very briefly, eczema is a little bit different. Eczema is all about taking care of the barrier. The barrier, being your skin for the most part, is usually messed up in some way or another in eczema. And so we actually can take the most severe cases. We do it at the NIH because we don't have to deal with insurance. Unfortunately, insurances don't, don't cover this very well. Um, but you can bathe people in lukewarm water, not hot. Hot water is bad for eczema. Um, 20 minutes a day, three times a day. Um, when you go home, you don't do this. Um, but, but when you're there, you're in a spa, 20 minutes a day, three times a day. Um, and while you're still wet, so when you take care of your barrier, you have to still be wet to put on your schmear, okay? Because if you schmear over dried out skin, you will keep the skin nice and dry, right? That's, that's the idea. Moisturizers we don't use. We, we moisturize with water, and then we put the Vaseline or the hydrolatum on top of that to lock it in. Do you hear the difference between the two? Um, in case you have that or in one of your children, this is the key. Um, and then they put on wet undergarments and then dry clothes, um, including the face. Um, it can be done at home, but we don't recommend it because you're putting, it ends up making a lot of steroids end up getting locked on top of your skin. <coughs> so we do it on a limited basis. But the point is, is that kids can walk in looking like this. And five days later, they look like this. And this lasts for a good long time. In, in our experience, if people continue on their regimens, not the wet wraps, they just continue on a good regimen of bathing daily um, and then putting on their schmear afterwards, um, this can last just pretty much indefinitely. Um, and if, if you have someone who has very severe eczema that they can't seem to get rid of any other way, let, let me know. Um, okay, but doctor, I've taken the antihistamines, the steroids, the Zolaire, everything you told me to do, and I still itch. And again, the answer is we don't know everything. Regardless of what we say, we absolutely don't know everything. Okay. This is my favorite cartoon ever from when I was a kid. Um, okay. So um, now, immune deficiencies. So I, uh, or my loved one, I'm just making sure time check, ooh, ooh, um, hardly has any good antibody. Why are you telling me that the IgE is so good if all the rest of the Ig is not very good? Answer one, of course, we really don't know the answer to that. Um, number two, though, is that when parts of your immune system don't work or they go rogue, right, then that can cause problems even if they're not incredibly efficient at doing whatever they're supposed to be doing. Okay? It's that simple. It's not a contradiction to have an immune deficiency and have an incredibly good immune reaction to allergens. It's not a contradiction at all. Because you don't need necessarily as good of a reaction to that allergen as you do to clear your mono or your staph or whatever it is. Um, and, so, and, and that's the most important point. The other thing is that um, uh, when we can't fight bugs, bugs actually can, once you're allergic, make things worse. Eczema is worse when we have staph on our skin. So that's why we tell people to actually bathe, uh, like go swimming in, in a chlorinated pool or, or a, put a little bleach um, in the bath because it's killing that staph off the skin. And if you have an immune deficiency that doesn't allow you to fight that staph as well, that's going to make something, for instance, like eczema worse. <coughs> I'm going to skip right over that. Um, and so, again, this is just a picture of, in, in the case of eczema, where the allergen comes in and causes the inflammation. But then once that inflammation is going, microbial toxins can keep it going. You don't need to be exposed to that allergen anymore. You just need to be exposed to bugs, and that's going to make your skin worse. And that's why we try to get things under control by controlling the inflammation and actually controlling the, uh, getting an antiseptic on the skin. Okay. Um, uh, drug allergies, as I mentioned, are more common in immune deficiencies, for the most part, because you're exposed to more drugs. The more drugs you're exposed to, the better your chances of having a drug allergy. It's that simple. 
Um, your impaired barrier, as I said, if you can't fight off bugs off of your surfaces, that allows allergens to get in too and wreak some havoc um, as well. And also it may well be that your gut flora dictates how good your, your, your protection from allergen, allergens uh, would be. So things to think about when you have an immune deficiency or recurrent infections. Was that episode of wheezing, difficulty breathing, fever, and an abnormal chest x-ray, was it asthma or pneumonia? I can't tell you how many times someone comes and says they've had recurrent pneumonia when they had recurrent misdiagnosed asthma. Okay? It can cause everything that it can look like a pneumonia, but the astute clinician is careful and actually says, wait a minute, this doesn't smell like a pneumonia altogether. Why don't I treat this as an asthma attack? And lo and behold, the antibiotics were never necessary. And also, when someone gets readmitted five or ten times for this and doesn't get any bronchiectasis, hmm, it really might be asthma and not a recurrent pneumonias. This is a big one that we see a lot, whether you're immune competent or not. Um, is the sinusitis that my kid keeps getting, the crud coming out of their nose, is it chronic hay fever or is it chronic sinusitis? It's a tricky one. You should consider both. Don't just assume one way or the other. Um, wait a minute, like I said before, if I put steroids in my nose or my lungs or my skin, isn't that going to impair my immune system even more? Well, you have to think about it as a risk benefit. If you've got bad eczema, your barrier is even worse. You put a steroid in there and improve the barrier, that also stops bacteria from getting in your blood. Okay? So it's not always such a terrible thing to, to cut, bring that inflammation down so that bugs can't get in. Um, and generally speaking, we don't have issues with it in most folks. Oh, and I passed out, and I got better when I got an EpiPen. Must have been anaphylaxis, right? The bottom line is, if you pass out because someone drew your blood, um, or if you pass out um, because you just won a million dollars, that would be great. Um, EpiPens will make you feel better. They're going to bring your pulse back up. But you didn't anaphylax. It's just something to think about. So um, unfortunately, I'm running a little bit, I'm almost, only have a couple minutes left. I'm just listing a number of immune deficiencies. IPEX, Job syndrome, Wiscott Aldrich, DOC8 deficiency, PGM3. These are all immune deficiencies. I don't know how many people in here have any of them that are highly associated with having allergies. And I want to make a small point about something called the hyper IgE syndrome. So, Job syndrome or the hyper autosomal dominant hyper IgE syndrome caused by mutations in STAT3 causes an autosomal dominant immune deficiency, which can affect bones, it can affect um, uh, joints, it can affect um, aneurysms and, and your, your, um, your blood vessels. It's a very specific one. Having a high IgE, like 10,000 or 50,000, doesn't mean you have the hyper IgE syndrome. Having bad eczema alone and nothing else can give you an IgE of 50,000, and you do not, not, not have a syndrome. Okay? Everybody understand that point? That's the confusion that happens all the time because, oh, it's hyper IgE. Well, that's kind of like saying I have the anemia syndrome. There are lots of reasons you could be anemic. There are syndromic explanations for anemia, or maybe you're not eating your spinach. So there are a lot of different possibilities for, for why that would happen. We are discovering more and more syndromes that explain high IgE, but usually they're associated with other stuff as well. Um, and then there are a number of others, uh, Netherton syndrome, ADA skid, high association, which we're really re recently recognizing with allergic disease. Um, and then there's some um, others uh, that I'm going to just show you a couple of items, but I would point out that probably the most common immune deficiency caused by, that is associated with allergy is the one we don't know about. Because you've grown up to, into adulthood, you've had some infections here, some infections there, you've had allergies driving you crazy your entire life, but you didn't fit into a certain category, we want to find that out because it teaches us about allergies and it may teach us about you and how to, how to make things better for you. These are just some examples of some interesting syndromes that are associated with allergies that we've, we've recently found. Uh, this is a boy who has a disease we call plaid and he is allergic to cold. So when you put water on his back and it evaporates, he breaks out into a hive and so does his family. Um, PGM3 deficiency is this disease uh, that I just mentioned that causes high IgE and can cause some scoliosis and bad eczema. Um, it's caused by a mutation in a pathway that affects something called glycosylation, which I've defined as an essential biological process which puts medical students to sleep. <laughs> and the important point about glycosylation is you can do something about it. The mutation is in a pathway, and it's blocking a pathway at point X. If you can just give something to just bypass point X, you might be able to fix it. 
So by finding the genetic explanation for this particular immune deficiency, we are now going to start a clinical trial giving something called N-acetylglucosamine to try and fix this particular rare disease, which was only understood because we found the genetic mutation. And how many other people are out there who have bad allergies and immune deficiency where this pathway is affected, even if they don't have this rare, rare, rare disease that I've just described? Take-home messages. Allergies are really quite common in immune deficiencies. Sometimes they're very similar to typical uh, non-immune deficient patients, and so other times they're unique. You have to be very careful about recognizing allergic disease and balancing that against is it allergic or is it infectious, and just have an open mind to it. That's the most important thing. Um, you have to be careful in both directions. And then making that right diagnosis and or finding the gene that causes it may, in certain cases, actually dictate a therapy that could help, not just a bone marrow transplant. So with that, I will uh, leave you. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. I don't know that we have time to answer to question them out loud. But if there's an officiant here who could make a ruling, by all means. But thank you for listening.